can lag. Welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. And uh, first for us, we are uh, for the first time hosting a panel discussion. And for the first time we are hosting a mill talk um, that has speakers who are not present. Um, but uh, I think we're uh, set in terms of the technology, and I'm going to begin the evening by uh, giving you some context on why uh, the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation would be um, hosting a talk or a lecture on women in manufacturing. So I'm going to switch us now to the presentation, and um, here we go. So hello and welcome to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. We're located in the last boiler house of what was for 130 years the Boston Manufacturing Company, the textile mill founded by Francis Cabot Lowell in 1813 in the heart of what is now downtown Waltham. I'm Bob Perry, the museum's executive director, and I thank you for joining us for what I am quite sure is gonna be a lively and informative event. A longtime friend of the museum, professional photographer Steve Dunwell, took this shot from a helicopter some years ago that shows our mill in the foreground and looks east over Boston and into Massachusetts Bay. And that can give you a sense of where we're located and how far we are away from the downtown. This is more or less what you would see at the museum if you were to visit tomorrow, but that's not possible, of course, during COVID, alas. Uh, I want to thank the Lowell Institute, whose generous support of our Mill Talk series makes tonight possible. The Lowell Institute has been sponsoring free lectures in Greater Boston since 1836. By extraordinary coincidence, though, the Lowell Institute was created by the bequest from the estate of John Lowell Jr., Francis Cabot Lowell's eldest son. It's my pleasure and, pr and privilege to give you some context for hosting a panel discussion here in this place on the roles of women in modern manufacturing. This is the way the BMC looked in 1825 through the eyes of artist Elijah Smith. Historians have told us that it is here that Francis Cabot Lowell conjured the concept of the mill girl. To quote our historian, Dr. Amy Green, Yankee farm women comprised the first large scale industrial labor force in the United States. Factory agents recruited unmarried women from Vermont, New Hampshire, and Western Massachusetts. End quote. Here's a, a Winslow Homer etching of a bobbin girl. And here are bobbin girls actually working on task in a textile mill. We're not sure if this is in Lowell, Lawrence, or Waltham, however. This undated photo from well over a century ago shows mill girls here at the Boston Manufacturing Company, so in this building. And it is here at the BMC that young women were, for the first time, the primary workforce for a manufacturing business, working the machines on the factory floor. Quoting from the biography, The Life and Times of Francis Cabot Lowell by Heim Rosenberg, the Waltham factory offered employment for young women paid in cash rather than in the form of provisions. Poverty did not drive them to the mills, rather it was the desire for some independence, to save for a dowry, support a brother in college, pay down the mortgage on the family farm, or buy fancy clothes and perhaps save money to buy a small house, end quote. When the Boston Manufacturing Company team went on to establish numerous textile mills on the Merrimack River in what we now know as Lowell, uh, the very effective mill girls concept went with them and they became a force. But factory life in the 19th century was not easy, to quote Dr. Green again. While countless poems raged against the tyranny of the ever ringing bell, testifying to the mill girl's despair, operatives also employed an amazing array of coping strategies as well. 
improving their minds through educational opportunities, writing essays published in magazines like the Lowell Offering on subjects from botany to boarding houses increase their self-esteem. Whether creating bonds with other women or encouraging relatives to join them, sisterly affection provided a rich social network, a powerful counterpart to psychic alienation. In the end, not only did many women successfully negotiate the world of the unknown, but many made it over to fit their needs." End quote. Improving their minds through educational opportunities, writing essays published in magazines like the Lowell Offering, um, the, and um, enjoying their newfound independence, they were now free from the patriarchal control of father or husband, now free to spend cash wages on themselves, whether improving their attire or saving for college. Finally, letter writing connected women to the places of their past and bridging the farm with factory. That's some of the origin story of women in manufacturing and a, and a glimpse into their earliest years as linchpins in America's burgeoning industrial base. But women's contributions to and impact on industry in this country have been continuous. Who can forget Rosie the Riveter, highlighting the essential workforce women were during the Second World War? But what about today? Well, that's what tonight is all about. Women have been a force in American manufacturing for over two centuries, and today they're leading companies, perfecting processes, maximizing quality, and driving innovation more effectively than ever before. Several years ago, the successful effort to establish the Massachusetts Chapter of Women in Manufacturing, a national trade association dedicated to providing year-round support to women who've chosen a career in the manufacturing industry, led them to discover the Charles River Museum. And because of the Mill Girls and their historical significance, the Massachusetts Chapter has made the Francis Cabot Lowell Mill and our museum their spiritual home, hosting their holiday celebrations here for several Decembers running. I'd like to personally thank Angela Regan and Susan Lenzi from Dassault Systems for their great friendship with the museum and for their time and energy spent helping to organize tonight's panel. Originally scheduled for March 2019, tonight's event was to have been a live in-person event, but due to COVID, surprise, surprise, we're taking it virtual, leaning heavily on the Zoom platform, which we'll be switching to in a moment, and we want to thank you for joining us for our first ever panel discussion. So here we go. Um, tonight's impressive panel is composed of mostly uh, composed mostly of accomplished members of that great organization, Women in Manufacturing. And it is my privilege to introduce you next, or first, to Christina Gutierrez, our moderator this evening, who will introduce and lead our esteemed panel. Uh, herself an experienced manufacturing engineer and project engineer, Christina is currently imparting her hard-won knowledge as a technical instructor for PTC University. Ladies and gentlemen, Christina. Gutierrez. Thank you for that marvelous introduction, Bob. Uh, again, my name is Cristina Gutierrez, and today I'm going to be your moderator. So let's get into introducing our amazing panelists. So, Bonnie, if you want to start. All right, great. Thank you, and welcome everyone for joining us here tonight. I'm excited to have you all here and excited to be part of this panelist. A quick disclaimer about myself, I am representing me, not the uh, organizations that I have worked for or that work that I work for currently. Um, right now, I am currently working for the a defense manufacturing industry here in Boston. I am a Six Sigma black belt uh, in continuous improvement, and I've been with this defense industry role for the last eight years. In my current role, I'm part of the Six Sigma global supply chain team and we go out to many suppliers and put in place improvement initiatives, work with them. So I've been in a lot of factories uh, to support our uh, industry. And then, and then prior to that, I was in consumer products working with the H.J. Heinz company for 20 years in food manufacturing. And yeah, it's a little disruptive, but um, I'm excited and I, I loved my career journey. I am Mariana McCormick. I currently work for Mass Development, which is a state quasi, and I help um, manufacturers um, 
finance new building acquisitions or equipment or clean energy systems. But I started my career in the 80s um, in graphic um, arts, it's specifically printing in the pre-press department. And it's taken me on an unbelievable journey and I've done so many different things and it wouldn't have ha happened if I didn't start in manufacturing. So um, it's been a great journey and, and thanks for being here and being a part of it. Uh, my name is Sarah Donovan. I am the CEO and president of the IG Marston Company. We are a small manufacturer. We make non-metallic washers and gaskets in Holbrook, Mass. Um, we are a family-owned business, um, six generations. I am the sixth generation. Um, I started my career in accounting and finance um, until I was brought into the family business. And uh, I've been always interested in how things are made and uh, how what we produce uh, becomes of a bigger item. So uh, that's, uh, I've been enjoying it a lot. Hi everyone, I'm Miriam Lansky, Continuous Improvement Manager for Olympus Corporation of America, the Scientific Solutions Division. And um, my background is mechanical engineering, but I immediately went to work in a factory as an equipment engineer. And uh, for the past 30 years have had various roles in manufacturing, always staying in the factory. Um, the last one before this was the director of manufacturing for a startup in Cambridge. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. Okay, so I guess really let's just start from the beginning. So Miriam, what led you to a career in manufacturing? How did you get here? Um, actually, it was the only thing I can imagine doing. Um, I was, I had a teacher who said, you're good in math and science, so you should be an engineer. And I said, what's an engineer? And I did a little research, found out what that was and said, okay, I want to make stuff. And to me, that, that's just, it's amazing to see some raw material turn into a product and how creative you can be. Um, yeah, I, once I got to manufacturing, I never left. I just love the fast pace. Um, you can make a difference every day. I also believe it's really important to promote manufacturing jobs in the Northeast, as well as other places in the U.S., but particularly in the Northeast, you know, not everybody's wants to go to college or needs to go. You know, there are plenty of jobs in manufacturing where part of what I do in continuous improvement is promote getting everybody involved and having everybody use all of their skills. So to me, it was a no brainer. There was a small part of it that was, I said, well, if I work in manufacturing, I could wear jeans to work every day. <laughs> that was important to me back when I was in college <laughs> as well. So I can add to that. My, my, career getting into manufacturing was quite different and very roundabout. I grew up with a, um, my family owned a restaurant. And so we were always in the food industry, always about serving customers, making food and trying to be efficient and, you know, cost effective. Um, outside of uh, when I graduated from college, I had a liberal arts degree. I went into uh, business with my father and we actually purchased a specialty food shop in Newburyport, Massachusetts. It was a deli catering retail and stuff of that. Um, again, another family run business and then um, wanted a change. And so I applied for a job at a local um, factory here in Newburyport called Alden Merrill. For some of you that are from the Massachusetts area, it was a dessert factory that was all over the Boston area. And I became a division manager for their six stores. Uh, soon afterwards, those six stores got divested because um, the H.J. Heinz Company bought the Alden Merrill Dessert Company. Um, so then my job sort of shifted and changed, and I supported the CFO and became a cost analyst and got really into crunching the numbers, which, you know, for the art major that I was, liberal arts, it was sort of um, um, a surprise, but I got really into that and then took on a continuous improvement 
training that the Heinz Corporation was doing for their um, 22 factories. So I became a CI person. And that's how I got down on the factory floor. Um, I was able to do a, get, get to visit and get exposure to a lot of factories within Heinz North America. At the time, it was all about you know bringing a camera and looking and seeing and um, love the continuous improvement. Got my MBA and then um, wanted to change, so I moved or I, I I got a company that was in Boston and and pivoted to the defense industry. So a big change, but again, it's all about people and process. So wonderful. Yep. I, I got started in sort of a, a similar way. I wasn't really exactly, I was a liberal arts major. I was kind of a the serious art geek and I studied graphic design and got out of school and cited I hated it. Like I, I just wasted this education in something I couldn't stand. So I accidentally got a graveyard shift processing files at a printer and I discovered that my the solution to my problem was solving problems. Like I loved it. It was just like I made something and I, I, I had purpose and it kind of brought me out of this funk and I started to really nerd out and get into this and learn about desktop publishing. This was all back in the 80s, kind of pre-everything. And then eventually I got hired by a um, manufacturer for automated systems and printing. Um, and what happened is that I, the extrovert in me all of a sudden had a place as a subject matter expert. And I became a subject matter expert in electronic prepress systems. And it was a job that everybody thinks, okay, manufacturing, you're stuck. But I traveled the world, like, I mean, I would go to Paris, I would go to Japan, a lot of time in Indiana. I mean, it wasn't always really sexy, but there's so many different careers. And, you know, from there I went into biotech and I, I've worked in med devices and it inspired, inspired me to go back to school, get my MBA. And, and now I'm, you know, I, I work for the state supporting manufacturers. I think, it's a great place to learn who you are and what you can do, and it will push your boundaries, but those boundaries need to be pushed. So, so my, my story is a little bit different. Manufacturing kind of came to me. Um, I was in accounting and finance, performing all kinds of different functions. I love math. Um, and then um, my father got sick and asked me if I wanted to come into the family business. So I said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. Um, so I showed up my first day of work in, um, you know, nylons and a skirt. And he said, yep, that's, that's not going to work. <laughs> and so uh, here I was thinking I was going to sit behind a desk and he, uh, he put me on the shop. He had me wiring equipment with him, running machines, um, you know, basically seeing everything from zero to 10. And, uh, I think that being able to see how everything worked helps me in, you know, my primary function, which is, you know, quoting and, and what kind of materials, what our capabilities are. Um, and I think it also earned me respect to the guys on the, you know, with guys on the floor. Um, they saw me doing what they do. Um, obviously not to the extent that they do, but um, that, you know, I do have respect for what they do. Um, so like I said, in that case, it kind of, it came to me and I, I love being a part of something bigger, um, knowing that we're creating something that is um, integral into a vehicle or a medical equipment. Um, and, you know, it makes us, especially you know, with the pandemic, we just saw how essential manufacturing is and that we're allowed to continue to operate and keep our employees uh, coming to work every day. And uh, I, I'm very happy that I made the decision to, to stay. Wonderful. Well, I mean, since you guys all have your varied stories of what brought you into manufacturing, I guess the next would be, how is it different breaking into manufacturing now compared to 20 years ago? So technical, cultural, social shifts, or has there been any? Well, I can share that. So 20 years ago is actually pretty much when I started going down to the factory floor, as I shared um, in the dessert factory. Um, but 
back then in the factories, longevity and staying in place was sort of the, the norm. You talk to people down on the factory floor and they've been there for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, although you see that today, um, pensions were big back then and it was mostly men in the, um, you know, management roles, women down on the factory floor. Change, if you were to do change management, it was hard. You know, this is the way we've always done it. You know, we, we, they didn't embrace change. And um, there were many little ways of working. This is the you know, little factories within factories. So uh, limited standards, there were lots of silos. Um, and ideas were actually hard to sell if you had an idea or if you were female and having an idea. But in the last 20 years, as I, I shared that I became part of the whole continuous improvement movement, that too has been the last 20 years. You know, well, it, it came the Toyota way and it was in the automotive industry, you know, way earlier than the food industry. But um, lean manufacturing, you know, the whole global landscape came in. Um, we needed to be more competitive and agile. And so it was all about getting cost out. So fast forward 20 years now, you know, from the people perspective, we're a very diverse workforce, um, a lot of rotations in um, the younger generation coming in, they're in and out, they might not stay, they don't stay 20 years, they might rotate in and out within a year or so. Um, but the goodness is this rotation brings in a lot of different cross industry ideas that we can then apply, you know, to be competitive and agile, we want that. Um, Lean manufacturing has led to a lot of automation. Um, a lot of ideas are innovation. They become um, automation solutions. We need to be agile. Bots are coming in to you know, get rid of a lot of redundant, non-value-added work. Um, and, and just we're valuing people for their thinking skills and their ability to solve problems, working as a team, collaborating, um, this whole global now virtual teams and now the Zoom. We have to think fast. We have to embrace change. Um, we have to just try it. Just do it. You can't go for that perfect uh, thing. So that's my take on where we are today. A lot different. And Miriam, I know you also work in continuous improvement. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, I was also going to mention, you know, the difference in breaking, breaking in, you know, 20 years ago. For me, it was 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> there were several jobs I didn't get because I was a woman. I had interviews where when I showed up, people just laughed at me. The job I ended up getting actually first I got because I was a woman because there was a quota in place. And, you know, at first I didn't like that idea, but I said, if that's what it takes to be able to break through the barrier and get in and do what I love to do and make a difference in an area that I want to, I'll take it. And I'll prove to them that they should have hired me anyway, whether there was a quota or not. And um, just a quick little story. The first place I worked was a little factory in way upstate New York. And I was an equipment engineer and I had week weekend coverage duty. And so part of that, you had to go into the factory on the weekend and walk around and make sure everything was okay. And I walked into the like back caves of where we, we made glass. And one of the guys who had been there for 40 years saw me. He said, excuse me, Missy, I think you're lost. <laughs> I didn't even know what to say. Like, I, <laughs> And now it, it is quite different as Bonnie said, like the, the workforce is so much more diverse that I don't get mistaken anymore. That I, they know I belong there and um, people are much more receptive to women being in industry. And um, I, I, it's not the same fight. I used to constantly get, get told, you know, go get your boss, sweetie. And uh, that doesn't happen anymore. I am. Um... I, you know, I sort of experienced something similar. Like there were just no women in manufacturing. In printing, there was the only avenue you could get was that if you knew how to type and they would sort of recruit women to type, then they would know computers and then they would have a leg up in pre-press. But it used to be, I'd go weeks with, you know, I travel from place to place and I would go weeks and not see another woman. 
I think it's gotten much better. Like, and I love seeing w- women in the front office and as decision makers and, you know, the Bonnies and the Miriams who are making like real differences. And, you know, Sarah, who's, who's running the place, but we need more of that. And we need to be supportive of each other of that. So I, I find that whenever I go into a manufacturing facility and I see another woman, I always give the nod because it's, it's a club. It's a, and it's a, it's a club I'm really honored to be a part of. And that's wonderful. And I mean, Sarah, you, I believe are the, correct me if I'm wrong, second vice president at your comp- female vice president of your company and first female president. Yes. Am I correct? And my company is 176 years old. So it took a little while. <laughs> <laughs> they caught up eventually. We got there. <laughs> and that's what matters. <laughs> so I guess talk about that. Talk about your experience in what is it like to be, I guess, at the very narrow top of the food chain? Um, so it's it's been interesting. Um, I think I was lucky that my father, um, I kind of, I don't want to say rode on his coattails, but he introduced me to people um and he was well respected and so um they knew he was he was bringing me up um i was alone for a while um after he passed and i did have to deal with some gentlemen who would say to me you know i remember when there weren't any women in the industry um and uh, you know there's been a lot of i talked to a lot of engineers who are looking to develop a new product and uh, can i talk to your your boss well uh, I am the boss, so um, I can help you. Uh, you know, and, and that's that's definitely tailored off a little bit um, as time has gone by. I've been in the industry for about 15 years, um, and so I definitely see um, a lot more women that are in those positions. Not as many as I'd like. I still mostly talk to men, um, but I definitely see that when I speak, um, there isn't that second guessing. Um, that's kind of you know that's that's refreshing. So I definitely see that there's improvements coming along. Well, I mean, definitely as a uh, woman just barely starting in this field, definitely a reassuring thing to hear. And I guess on the topic of change, so let's talk other types of changes that are hitting manufacturing. It's not just about diversity. It is also about things like sustainability. So what would you say manufacturing's role is in sustainability? Does manufacturing have an onus to sustainable practices? And if so, have your companies embraced it? So I'm gonna throw this one over to Miriam. So what do you feel? What's manufacturing's role in sustainability? Um, It's the same as every other human on the planet. It's absolutely their responsibility. Um, And I actually learned this. It wasn't something I always believed in. It was a, a company I worked for about 15 years ago, where the CEO there declared that we need a triple bottom line. It's not just about profit. It's people, profit, and planet. And he put in place an edict that all new products designed had a goal of zero to landfill at the end of their life, that everything had to be reusable, remanufacturable, or recyclable. And we actually we actually achieved, I think it was like 85% of a product on one of our new products. Um, and I think it's, it's important. It's got to come from the top, but it also can come from the bottom and work its way up. I like it when, you know, I go out and see the operators and I say, how could, how could this be more efficient? And they're like, well, if I didn't have to unwrap this, to rewrap this, to put it in that, you know, and to, to see all the waste that's generated, um, it's not just about efficiency of how they put things together, but I did an experiment once we were trying to see the maximum capacity of a production line and we did the, we did the process over the day, but we didn't, we didn't think about taking the trash away and our trash got overloaded because of all the unpackaging of all the individual parts. And what we learned from that was, you know, we could work with our vendors and make reusable packaging that we sent back and forth. And then there was no waste. So, I think it's I think it's absolutely a manufacturer's actually they probably generate a, a lot of the way so I think it's it's very important. Absolutely. And Marianne, I believe you also had something to add to this point. Yes. 
Uh, I am, so working for the uh, Massachusetts State Finance Agency, we actually finance a lot of upgrades for clean energy systems. And it's, we, we use this thing called PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy, which is not sort of unusual for a lot of states to do. We're a little bit behind the game. But because of that, I've gone out to a lot of manufacturers to see what we can do to encourage them to upgrade to clean energy systems. And it not only is it the right thing to do, and it's the right thing to do, it's also financially beneficial too. Like it's a situation where everybody benefits. Like I think that if you are a decision maker in manufacturing, it is the right thing to do, I think number one and most importantly and all the way through for people, but it might also be the best thing for your bottom line. And there are programs out there that can help you get to that point. Um, so, you know, and I think kind of getting back to the female aspect of it, where we're constantly having to look at the bigger picture, you know, take a look at the bigger picture on this because there's opportunities there you might not even know about. I agree. Um, they want to see what are, what are we what are we currently doing or what do we plan to be doing uh, as far as recyclability and and what the recyclability is of the products that we're supplying them. So I definitely see that uh, it, it's kind of dropped off in the last few years, but I think that's going to be coming back and and uh, you know I think that it's going to become more and more important. Um, and I think to uh, the point made earlier. You know, manufacturing, we, we do generate quite a bit of waste. Um, so whatever we can do on our part to help the environment, uh, I think is very important. Absolutely. And I mean, that kind of really brings us into our next. So we talk about all the change happening in existing companies, but I guess we also want to talk about the new faces we're seeing in manufacturing, right? So you've got startup companies, legacy companies. There's really a variety of different I guess flavors at this point of manufacturing. So Sarah, having, you know, working at what you said, a hundred and some odd years in the making, what would you say would this difference in starting legacy going with your startup? So this question is interesting. Uh, so I have an embarrassing story, but uh, we um, had some turnover um, in the plant. A gentleman retired and you know we are one of those companies where people they they, they hang around for a while um so when it finally came time for me to review some resumes of who was going you know potential replacement and people they wanted me to interview it was all female and it wasn't until that moment that i had just pictured in my head that it was going to be a male that was going to be replacing that that person and i'm embarrassed to say that but i think that what's important here is that it's kind of a, a two-pronged approach we definitely need to make sure that more women are applying for these kinds of jobs and so that more people who are the decision makers and the hiring, uh, making the decision on hiring, see those resumes. Because not until I saw that, that I realized, hey, yeah, well, of course it can be. And I think that that's, you know, the more women that we can get involved in manufacturing, applying for those jobs, I think can make a difference to the people that are making the decisions on the hiring. Absolutely. No, 100% agree. Anyone else? Anything on that? Yeah, I also think too, that it's an issue, you know, you have to really look at the company and kind of from a, a bigger standpoint, for instance, I've worked for startups, and I've worked for Kodak. Um, and you might find something small and entrepreneurial within a large company. And at the same time, you might think you have a lot of security in a large company, and you might not. Um, you really can't take it. Don't go on assumptions. Like, be prepared, be open-minded, and find the right situation for you. I think that is, no, absolutely, absolutely sound advice. Which, I guess, you know, as we're talking about new ideas, really, in manufacturing, you've got the workforce of the future. So what is the workforce of the future? What does that mean in the context of manufacturing? And how can women best prepare for the changing landscape of manufacturing? I think Bonnie might have something really 
yeah. to, to this point? Um, I, again, think this is a good question or a good thought is, you know, you talk about workforce, you know, your last, the last question I talked about was like, everything's about automation and putting bots in. Workforce is people. It's not a robot. And so as a woman leader, you know, workforce of the future, you as the leader and leading a team, it's going to be really important to make sure you build teams and that you never stop listening to the people. Um, and automation is in factories, but there are people on the left and right of that machine that we need to honor and respect. So um, work for, preparing for the workforce of the future is making sure we, we connect the human being to the machine and to keep that fabric together and never forget about the people because it's the people that are part of the culture and they're the people that have the ideas that brought forward that innovation, um, foster the diversity, foster the diversity of thought, honor those ideas that are coming in. And we have to embrace the change and flexibility just as we've done in the last nine months here, we've had to become flexible and adopt and adapt to these new systems. From a career and growth perspective, um, you know, what, what Sarah was talking about and, and, and Marianne about these, these women coming in and, you know, I have a mentor at work that I talked to um, the other day and was asking her and she's just like, never stop learning, which I'm a total all about learning. Try, put yourself on the edge learn about a new part of the business because it's the whole business is one but if you sort of bounce around and expose yourself to the different parts of the business then you get this aha moment that you sort of see how it's all working then as a leader you're more effective but you also need to as women show your value so if you have a project or if you in, um and did some sort of program use that your brand of you is what you have to get out there. You know, that your why are you valuable and you have to have these measures and metrics more, I think, than men because we need to sell ourselves and have something quantitative to say, you know, you want to be the one that they call to say, can you help change this, you know, team or group because you added value? No, absolutely. And I mean, let's call a spade a spade here our industry is largely skewed male do you feel that uh by and large we're not talking the individual you know jerk at work but by and large do you feel men have been receptive to women entering the manufacturing workforce not just the mill girl but really moving into positions of power i, I do I, I believe now more than ever probably in the last seven years i've seen a huge change in the business um so uh, yes what what about the others anyone else please yeah i, I would agree i mean to, to the to the kind of the point that i made earlier i definitely speak more to um you know men and women and i don't get that you know second guess question it's it's I think also too to an earlier point is that it, uh, that Bonnie sort of brought up. You really do need to, you know, advocate for yourself. Um, you know, you're better than what you think, and and imposter syndrome is such a jerk. Like, you just don't buy into it. And you know, take the intellectual risks. You know, something doesn't want somebody doesn't want you to learn something, then you really should make a point of doing it. With all of that said, though, we can't do it alone. So, you know, Sarah's story kind of of kind of realizing that she had these resumes and that all of a sudden things had changed or, you know, Bonnie's kind of awareness in the last seven years that things have um, changed. You know, we we're part of this and we are part of even though we've been through a long careers at manufacturing, we're still part of it. And we're also parts of other people's future. So help talk, identify. And I think it's getting better, too. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Yeah, I, I agree. There's tons of opportunity. You got to, you know, to to prepare kind of for the future network. 
I hate that word. It's something I never did and everybody kept saying it, but it's so important. Um, you gotta, you gotta help lift each other up and support each other. Uh, um, one of the things that I didn't realize, I, I minored in what was called at the time industrial psychology, just because it was kind of interesting to me. I use that more than my mechanical engineering degree. So if there's, there's another thing I would say is like the relationships, your communication skills, it's so important. So actually, uh, I guess, expand a little more on that. What exactly is industrial psychology? I've truly never heard of it. Well, in the 80s, <laughs> it, was, um, it was things like ergonomics, um, man-machine interface. I think now it's called GUI, graphic user <laughs> interface. I'm not sure all those. But, but it was also about change management, um, communication styles. So I went to a very, very engineering school for college. And um, as other people can probably attest, engineers are generally not really good communicators. We tend to be introverts. Um, we tend to know, think we know it all. <laughs> um, so I was really trying to, to, to well round out a little bit more for when I entered the workforce. Um, I didn't want to go crazy and study history or anything, but I, th I thought that that would help. Um, and, it, and it really truly has. I mean, I, I go back on that now. I take a lot of classes, you know, online of, of um, communication, how to, um, what was it, selling your ideas for technical professionals was something that I took learning how you have to self-promote um, because if you don't, nobody's gonna, you're responsible for your own career. And it's important that, you know, you get allies, but nobody's gonna, my boss, my first boss told me that actually, he said, you know, I'm going to do what I can, but ultimately you are responsible for your career. And I've taken that to heart for the past 30 years and always looked as they say, two jobs ahead making sure I'm getting that broad base of experience so that if something came up, I could, I could go into that if I wanted to. Well, no, definitely. I mean, especially to anyone really just new entering this field, I think sometimes it can feel a little overwhelming. So if we could all just kind of go around and discuss if you were to have a person, a young woman and trying to enter manufacturing and she would say, what are my, what are skills? What is like my tool belt go to? I need to learn either technically or personally. What would you that is? I think I think Miriam, you have muted yourself. You froze there at the end. <laughs> so I guess yeah. Uh, let's say five five key things you would say that you would find are good tools to bring into manufacturing. manufacturing. I can take that just to start. Um, kids coming out of college, uh, where I work today, it's a lot of interns are coming in from different engineering schools, and there's leadership development programs. They call them LDPs, and you know they're they're very competitive. But if you're a college age female that's interested in getting into manufacturing, go out to the manufacturing companies and and get these interns internships and um, that'll tell you if you like it if it's a leadership development program they put you in um, you might be on operations floor for um, six months and then you're in supply chain for six months at a different total different state and factory or in your finance so you're getting exposure to a whole bunch of different uh, business areas and then you know, you've been groomed for that specific com company if you're interested in it, and then you um, accelerate into a position. Um, from uh, also, if you're a young employee joining in, even even my age, get a mentor, get a coach. You know, I recommend having a male mentor and a female mentor. Uh, when I first joined the defense industry and I was in a disruptive career. I didn't understand all the acronyms and the whole business acumen was so crazy compared to what I was used to. Remember, I came from a small restaurant environment and I had a, a mentor that was had been there for 35 years and he would, you know, sort of coach me in. And then I had a female that was sort of showing me the ways of working in it. So um, 
always ask questions, raise your hand, ask questions, ask more questions and listen, listen at all levels of the factory, listen to the operator down on the floor who has all those ideas because they're so close to the product and listen to the leadership and the middle management. And, you know, just especially with the operators on the floor, go back and close that loop. If they have a great idea, how can we execute that? It's, it's probably the most important thing we can do in manufacturing, you know, honor our people and their ideas. So other thing on alumni, if you go to a college, always use your alumni team, go into those events in Boston, meet up with them, network. You know, it's something that I didn't do in my younger years, but I should have done sooner and I do it now. <clears throat> Absolutely. Anyone else have anything I, you would say? Yeah, I also think too on the, the networking part, everyone's like, oh, I hate networking. But remember, you have something to contribute to the conversation. Everybody does. And just know that and feel that and that you have the right to be there. And, you know, I always walk into every room and feel like I'm the most awkward person. And that's my superhuman power because nobody can be more awkward than me and I can't screw it up. I mean, really just embrace that. And, and don't worry because people are more likely to be your friend than not. Also, I, this is going to sound really weird, but um, if you have the opportunity to take a public speaking course, there's some point in your life, whether it's an interview or advocating for yourself, as much as you're like, God, that's the last thing I want to do in the world, that's even more the reason to do it, because you never get through this without having to stand up and, and, and say something that, that's important to you. And I also feel that, you know, ha taking a business course, if you can see what your managers want and what the point of what you're doing is, it's going to help you make better decisions about your career. And you may be surprised about how far you go. So having that language ahead of time is really valuable. I mean, definitely I can speak to the public speaking course. A hundred percent of my job is public speaking. So having the ability to communicate that way is definitely, definitely important. And then Sarah, yeah, what would you, what would your advice be on those necessary career tools for women entering manufacturing? So I'm kind of going to roll it back kind of quite a bit, but, um, you know, I, I took my two young boys and I took them to, uh, to work one day. And what they said to me is, uh, mom, you have a boy job. <laughs> and so, you know, which I was kind of taken aback by, um, kind of flattered and also offended at the same time. But I think that, you know, it, it, it made me think, you know, this STEM, so what, you know, when I was in school, STEM was not, not a thing. And I think that, you know, people getting introduced to it at a young age and knowing that those opportunities are out there and exploring all of them. I mean, I was a big math fan, but, you know, engineering didn't come into my, you know, into my world. And I wish it had, I, I really would have liked to, gone there but um so i to anybody that likes math um likes being a part of something creating something you know experience all different parts of the manufacturing process uh from marketing uh where you learn about a product um raw material uh, all of it just and, and find where you fit because uh, there's there's something for everybody in manufacturing that, that's what i feel anyway and, and I'll even add back to what Mar Mariana was saying is, you know, taking different courses outside. Even if you're doing something like Mariana, before we went live, we were talking about little hobbies that we have. You know, she's a, a rower, you know, like the head of the Charles Rower. That teaches you something. Taking that knowledge and bringing it in, that's, you know, about teamwork and working together and the benefits of having, you know, eight eight women on a boat, you know, and the power that it has. And, you know, don't be afraid to bring your completely different outside world hobbies into your ideas at work, because that's how, that's how we get stronger. You know, I, I, I attend a lot of health and fitness courses. I'm a trainer outside, but I bring a lot of what I learn in those into my workspace. So they both add value back and forth. So Absolutely. And I guess also speaking a little to, I mean, a point you brought up and uh, something Sarah brought up, how much has changed uh, 
at my high school, we didn't have a robotics team. And my senior year, I became the captain of the first robotics team. So things, STEM wasn't as much a thing. And now it's really moving with more easy access to technology. It's not uncommon for, for example, a school to have laptops. So how do you feel this technology changes maybe on the educational level and in the workforce level is changing manufacturing? So it's now not just about physical strength, but you have an array of different avenues to pursue in manufacturing. Anyone who would like to take a question? So I guess Sarah, speaking, what uh, technological changes have you guys seen over the last hundred years from when you guys opened up to now? Um, so really our, our product line will change and our raw materials will change based on what, um, what's going on in the industry. So the company started out making leather washers, for example, um, with a mallet and uh, a die. Um, so, uh, then we use rubber and then introduction of plastics. And of course, plastics is ever evolving. Um, so, uh, and also equipment that goes with that, how to cut customers are looking for tighter tolerances, cleaner parts, um, you know, being able to adapt to what the customer wants and using those technologies to, to, pr to produce for them. Everything's, you know, tighter, like I said, tight, tighter tolerances and, uh, and things like that. Uh, and computers also help in, in designing. Now we can share drawings with with a customer, so we make sure that you know what we uh, think they want is is definitely what we're going to be giving giving to them by sharing drawings and and, and things like that. I I can add that <clears throat> when I was in consumer products, say in a in a bottling factory, uh, it used to be that you would you know get capital to be able to bottle those. Um, product that you were selling, but now the way that our supply chain is changing so rapidly in logistics, it's, you know, you, you, it's, it's risky to invest in a big fancy piece of equipment that's going to be packaging out because the packaging is changing. And just again, how we've seen in the last year, how, how it's all shifting and changing it. it things are no longer in cases. Now they're shifting eaches and just the whole dynamics is changing. So it's very risky to invest in uh, pieces of machinery that are gonna be supporting your packaging some, sometimes. No, absolutely. And I guess we have some questions here. So I guess we're here in the United States, obviously we are familiar with our culture here, but what have you noticed maybe in your experience working abroad at the changing perspective of women in uh, manufacturing abroad. Yeah, I've had some interesting experience with that. Back in the early 2000s, my company sent me to Germany with a couple of male engineers. And um, it, it was disturbing how I was treated. Um, and then just prior to the pandemic, I was in Germany again with this company and I was like the same as not back, you know, 20 years ago, but I was treated as an equal and my opinion was valued. So um, I've seen that change as well over the years. One thing I personally, I don't know if this is exactly related to the question, but I found really interesting is being in the lean Six Sigma arena, you know, lean originated in Japan and um, my company has, uh, we're actually headquartered in Japan and, and I find that um, we're, we're having to teach them. Um, so that surprises me. I thought in that area, they'd be ahead of us. Um, actually our European office is, um, is the leader in it and kind of the, the Americas are second and then the Asians are in sort of third place, not really, but um, so it's been interesting to see. I didn't expect that. Wonderful. Anyone else with maybe any experience? Uh, I actually had a really um, special conversation with a woman <clears throat> before the holidays. I've been supporting a project in Saudi Arabia, and she she was on my project team. We were training some Six Sigma um employees over there in an office and she was HR and um, her and I and 
and had a conversation offline without the others in the training, just compare and sh you know she was asking me is it what is it like over there working in a factory do women have all these you know privileges and everything and and I, I I said no it's it's challenging even for us over here you know that we still have to you know express our voice and and to get it out and and she was saying it, that that she's starting to feel more and more comfortable over there so it was it was encouraging um, and she's a very strong woman and she's in a position and I was, I was really proud of her, but um, it was, it was nice to have that conversation with her. Absolutely. No, I mean, it's always, I guess it's very reassuring to hear that. Um, my, my mother is, both my parents are immigrants from Colombia and my mother is an engineer and I grew up always watching my mom in engineering. So I guess it was always kind of, a natural progression in my family, but it's definitely good to see those perspectives changing, not just here in our own little United States bubble, but seeing those changes abroad. So would you have any, I guess we have gone through our advice, but have you noticed anything, I guess, surprising? Is there anything when, you know, entering a career in manufacturing that you maybe didn't expect that you might have expected before any? preconceived notions that you have seen radically change in yourself? I think the thing that I've found surprising is that there's just so many different things you can do and, you know, you can be the person that you are and you should be like, it's don't try to fit somebody else's mold. Like I just, I never thought there'd be a space for an extrovert in, in manufacturing and there definitely is. Um, it's just, you can you can make it be really awesome if you want to and it's not easy like it, it sometimes you have to jump around sometimes it's not the right company sometimes they're jerks sometimes they're awesome but you do have some agency in this to to create a really rich and um dynamic career and i think you know whim um you know, I always felt like I was in my own little bubble and I was kind of alone until I found WIM. And now that I've been able to communicate and, and meet up with other women in manufacturing, I think it's been a huge help. Um, I don't feel so alone anymore. So, you know, seeking out those, those other groups, even it's just a women's group, but especially women in manufacturing, um, you know, can definitely help. It, it, it's, it's helped me, um, like I said, not feel so alone. <laughs> I think for me, the biggest surprise, like I was raised that girls and boys can do this and whatever they want to do anywhere. So when I entered the workforce and, and there was bias, I was shocked. I just, I was blind to that, that. So I just went about that. I'll just prove myself. And, um, and, you know, some people say sometimes you have to work harder. Um, and it just, it surprised me that I wasn't listened to in meetings. I had to make an extra effort to speak up more, you know. Um, but I agree with what everybody said. I personally think manufacturing is the best profession out there. It's fun. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, I've had great opportunities to do different things, work in all different size companies, travel around the world. Um, the other day I was speaking to someone in Hamburg, Germany, you know, we were collaborating. It just, it's amazing to me how much opportunity there is and how fun it is. I, I have not been bored <laughs> in 30 years. And, and I, I'll second that, that. I agree. If you would ask me, you know, 30 years ago, what was I going to be when I grew up? It would never have been working for a factory and <laughs> never. And, you know, so, and, and much less, you know, right now I'm, I'm in the defense industry, so I never would have thought that either. But um, it is like Miriam says, you, you, you build a family and you build a network and, you know, you can go back and talk to people that you worked with 10, 15 years ago, even if it's in a different, you know, factory and, um, they're still out there and you can always reach out to them and talk to a safety manager in Ohio. Hey, remember when we did this project, they're always willing to help you and share ideas. And just because you switch businesses doesn't mean you've lost those 
friends and colleagues. And, you know, just like women in manufacturing is a great network. Um, you know, you, you still have your network out there of people in this, in the same thing. So it's, it, you're right. There are a lot of great opportunities and it's not just for the engineer or the STEM major, um, liberal arts major. And it, and it doesn't mean that those type, you know, women just go into the, you know, typical HR roles. They're all over the place now. And it's, it's exciting. And I guess lastly, because we're really going to wrap up about now, but any final points? Is there any kind of any final words of wisdom? Let's see, Sarah, what you got? <laughs> well, I was just, uh, you know, thinking about the point made earlier. I mean, manufacturing is a great field to be in. Um, like I've said, you know, I like being a part of something. You can make a difference, you know, just looking at all the the whole process, making a difference, process improvements, dealing with people, you know, you're not just, you don't have to just go into one box, you know, just finance or there's so many different things within manufacturing. And it is, uh, I don't want to use the word brotherhood, but kind of you, I feel there's other companies that also manufacture that I deal with. And we have, hey, maybe we're having supply chain issues. We can kind of you know, bounce things off of each other. I feel your pain. You know, it, it is kind of a, a, you know, your own little, uh, I, again, brotherhood. I don't know what, another word for it, but. Um, a kinship. Yes, there you go. A kinship, you know. And um, I know that I, in my uh, life outside of work, I don't really come across anyone in manufacturing. Um, they're mostly in finance or the service industry. So when we go to, you know, say a dinner party, obviously not lately, but. Um, you know, when I, people ask me what I do, they say, you mean, you actually, you actually make something like, yes, yes, <laughs> we actually make something. Um, so it's a, I, I think it's a, a pretty cool field to be in. I, I think it's important to have fun. Like this can be really fun. Like to this day, I, I love going down the cereal box aisle and saying, oh, look at that. They did a reverse trap on that. Like I just, you know, it takes me hours to shop for food because it's fun <laughs> so i hope you have a fun career because it's awesome well ladies thank you so so much it has been uh an honor and a privilege to have this panel and i hope you guys had as much fun as i did so i'm going to send us back to bob hi bob couple of switches here and change things around. As a, a man not in manufacturing, I'm really inspired. Um, I grew up a uh, son of an engineer who uh, worked in manufacturing for Fairchild Semiconductor and Timex and who um, took uh, us around the world. And uh, I can safely say that when I was growing up and, and um, observing my father's life, there were no women in leadership in manufacturing. And one of the lessons that I've learned from tonight's talk is that, and I heard this from a couple of you, it, it, it seems like it's taken probably until maybe uh, seven to 10 years ago before it really seemed to tip, but I get the feeling that it, it really has tipped in, in recent years. Um, all right, we're gonna wrap things up. I'm gonna switch gears back to our live cameras. I wanna thank very deeply the five women who made this happen tonight. Bonnie Perkins, Mariana McCormick, Miriam Lansky, Sarah Donovan, and moderina, moderator, moderina, moderator, Christina Gutierrez. And thanks also to Susan Lindsay and to Angela Regan for providing both essential leadership and support that made tonight happen. And thanks to the Lowell Institute for underwriting our Mill Talk series. Um, and thanks to all the women in your lives out there who are also in manufacturing. I know that there are many now and that is really encouraging. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening. We have several Mill Talks cooking in the pipeline and hope you'll join us for them and other virtual programming. We have a Tuesday Tech Talk series, for example, that resumes on February 16th. Um, full information about all our scheduled and past events can be found on our website at charlesrivermuseum.org. Um, 
that wraps it up for tonight. Thank you very much. Stay healthy and uh, we will see you soon. Good night.